and welcome to the Healthy Half Hour Podcast. We are your hosts, Richard and Karen Inslee. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast is your resource for all things healthy, and we will be discussing how to make nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle choices work for you. We will be sharing our own personal insights along with research gathered from working in the health and fitness industry for the past 10 years. Our show is brought to you by The 7 Day Shred, which can be found at 7dayshred.com. And please feel free to visit our podcast website, which can be found at healthyhalfhourpodcast.com. And now on to today's show. Welcome back. So, unfortunately, Mother Nature's not playing very nice with us right now, is she? It's uh, ruined our um, plans for last night. We were going to go glow golfing, and they actually cancelled the the whole event because of like the rain, which was pretty miserable. Eh? Yes, it was a sad state of affairs. The uh... The weather just closed in and it didn't really get much above two or three degrees. And yeah, it was just a meh kind of day. So yes, it cancelled the uh, the evening for us. And uh, yeah, so we ended up just staying in and watching the rain come down the window and watched a movie or two. So that was about it, really. Yeah, I'd much rather have been golfing because if anybody doesn't know what glow golfing is, it's actually having a golf ball that glows in the dark and you golf in the dark. So, so. yeah, you don't tee off till like 8 p.m. And when you hit the ball or you hit the ball on something solid, it lights up for about 15 minutes so everybody can see where their ball goes. Unless and it's in the water. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, you can see it in the water, you just can't retrieve it. Well, yeah. And so, yeah, it's just a bit of fun, just kind of wind up the uh, end of year golf. So, uh, but yeah, not to be this year, so how oh well. Yeah, because these other years we've actually been golfing till midnight in T-shirts and shorts. It's been so nice, but... And then other years we've had golfing and there's been frost on the ground, so... Who knows? Yeah. So, like, that's a like, little bit of a personal update, but uh, today, today's podcast, I, I actually think we're just going to be going probably as much backwards and forwards with our comments as what the, the topic's about, because this, I don't know, it, it just is a minefield and... The, the, well, I say there's just so much to consider, isn't there? Yeah, so today we're going to talk about the vicious cycle of diet, sleep and stress. We're originally going to just do it about stress or sleep or diet, but basically these three things are so intertwined and a lot of the times, again, you don't get one without the, without the other and without the other. So again, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the protein sparing modified fast and how it was kind of a crash diet and how you basically should just get in and get out. And I mean, we did a podcast blah, probably a year or so ago about there's only three sorts of diets. And again, on that one, the, the weight loss diet was one of the three. So a therapeutic diet or a maintenance diet. So with a weight loss diet, again, as with the protein sparing modified fast, if you if you're just following like a lower calorie diet or you may be doing something keto, but you're certainly not eating like you normally would with the goal of actually losing some weight, uh, st stick to it, get it done and then go to the maintenance diet. Don't. And again, this the vicious cycle, we see it all the time with clients of in and out and in and out and start and stop and up and down. So again, we're going to talk today about maybe some strategies, maybe some things you can do to try and break that vicious cycle and actually stick with what you're doing. And the stress of micromanaging your diet and the stress over um, not losing any weight is worse for your, for your body than anything else and like just really drastically affects those cortisol levels. So the actual micromanaging and like at the end of the day, who wants to be weighing and measuring everything for the rest of their lives? Yeah, and when it comes to dieting, really the world is against you. So if you go to any grocery store or anything, there's shelves and shelves and shelves full of basically crap that's uh, not real food. And I mean, in my opinion, we should call processed food something different than whole foods. Because again, it really 
doesn't come under the umbrella of food. It just comes under the umbrella of stuff you stick in your mouth that's basically low nutrients, high in chemicals and other stuff. And really, a lot of the time, your body doesn't know what to do with it. So again, I again think of it, I don't think of it as food, really. It's more fillers than anything. And food is what comes out of the ground and what you should really be eating. So again, with the diet cycle, consistency is always the key. And I mean, I know um, it's easy to, again, I hate the term fall off the wagon, but again, people love to use it. And people do, they just fall off and come back on, fall off and come back on. And, and again, they, oh yeah, I had a plan and then something happened. So sometimes, again, you don't need a plan as well as you need a contingency plan. Well, strategies to navigate when things do go wrong. Because things will go wrong. So plan for things going wrong. I mean, it's not all sweetness and light. And even in our life, yes, things go wrong. And again, sometimes I hear, well, I got, I was in town and all of a sudden I realised I got another appointment to go to and I, I got no food with me. Sushi! I said that on one of the podcasts not long ago. And um, I've said on the podcast not long ago too, go hungry, big deal. It ain't the worst thing. It ain't, you ain't going to die from it unless you've got blood sugar regulation issues where you will feel um, unwell or dizzy or, again, just because that low blood sugar in your body doesn't regulate it as, me- as well as it maybe it should, then go without. I mean, skipping lunch or breakfast or supper isn't going to be the worst thing and have something when you get back home again if it's supper something light but it really isn't going to be the death of you so again with that again a lot of times we find people oh well I had to do this I had to do that and I mean one strategy which again we tell people time and time again is create a space for your life your life is yes crammed in between kids jobs grandkids maybe husbands wives whatever else and other things you've got to do but you've got to create some space in there for you because if you don't nobody else will Uh, and again it may seem a little harsh that yes you can't go and do whatever you're going to do but at the end of the day take a look in the mirror that's the end result of you not creating that space in your life to actually make things happen for you And the willpower thing too, I mean, people are, oh yeah, well, I've got no willpower. Well, like I said before, willpower will run out. It's like flexing a bicep. You'll get to the point where you won't be able to flex your bicep anymore because it's tired. So dump willpower up now before it does run out and then just kick in with the discipline. Because I mean, at the end of the day, anybody that does a goal or reaches a goal They'll reach that goal through discipline at well over willpower any time. You ask any bodybuilder, any athlete, anybody that's got a head in business or in any successful thing they've done. And I mean, willpower was really not part of it. Initially, it may have been. But again, that willpower does actually just disappear. Another big thing as well is people go um, out to restaurants and places like that. And then they start making excuses. Well, I don't really tell people what you're doing. Don't be shy about it. Just say, look, I'm watching what I'm eating for the time being. I've got, a, I've put a few pounds on. I need to lose this little bit of weight. So I'm going to eat X, X and X. And I mean, do that. It's You're better off telling people what you're doing. And that also that, again, with the especially with family members or uh, friends or uh, maybe co-workers, again, that bit of community can uh, keep you accountable. But don't, don't be that food Nazi, like I've said before, and that one person at work that, oh, oh, they're on a diet again, oh, they're doing this, like, and, you know, just, you know, like you say, implement some strategies that work around your personal and professional life. But, you know, don't let... Don't let it take over your life and increase the stress levels even more because that's negative to the to the health and weight management anyway. Yeah, and I, like I say, the community thing, again, it can reduce that stress. And I mean, uh, Gene Nidich in uh, 1963 was having the same problem with losing weight. So she invited a few, a few of her neighbours around in New York and... 
within a couple of months they were meeting regularly and then other people got the idea and she started Weight Watchers. And I mean, Weight Watchers, for all its faults, is still based on that community thing. And again, it's helped a lot of people purely through sharing those ideas and about what are you what you're doing. So don't underestimate the you know the power of community and actually telling people what you're doing. And again, if you're having those stressful moments, like Karen said, I mean, it's shared in the community, and other people may have been having those problems, and basically that can really help. So again, with stress, stress is uh, a massive part of uh, of dieting because again, you're putting a stress on yourself mentally, and also you're putting a stress on your system a little bit because again, you're reducing those calories, and so these stress things can not only build up mentally but also build up physically. And I was um, talking to a friend um, a few weeks ago, and that's why a friend. <clears throat> I ain't got any. <laughs> And this is where the title from that vicious cycle of dieting and health and weight management really came about because this particular person, and I know that she's going to be listening to the podcast. So I'm not yes, gonna, it's you. <laughs> so I'm not going to mention any names, but this is not just um, relevant to this um, particular person, but it kind of helped me to think, okay, well, you know, people are not on their own when it comes to this, but... This particular person, like most people, they have like a very stressful life and they also are not sleeping very well, but they also are looking to reduce that number on the scales. And there's such interconnections between all of them because stress, well, just lack of sleep is going to increase your stress levels. So when your stress levels increase, your cortisol levels go up and then you become at a higher risk of becoming insulin resistant and type 2 diabetes. For those who don't know, sweetie, what's cortisol? Cortisol is the stress hormone. Okay, it's a hormone. Okay, this could be somebody's first podcast. And I mean, I know we've talked ad nauseum (laughs) about uh, cortisol, but uh, it's it's not all bad. But I mean, no, no, no. And cortisol is your internal coffee pot. So basically cortisol is like high first thing in the morning and that's normal. So cortisol is your internal coffee pot and we've said this before and it gets you out of bed. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. No, cortisol, but excessively high levels of cortisol over long periods of time are, yes, definitely bad. And at at the wrong time of day. And at the wrong time of day. So I was talking to this friend saying that because... She said that she'd been working with somebody on her nutrition and diet. And I was just asking whether or not they were doing like a nutrient timing um, protocol where you keep your, your food choices are going to keep your cortisol levels high in the morning, your insulin levels low at the same time. And then your nutrient intake is manipulated over the day so that your cortisol levels, on, as they naturally lower, stay lower and are not boosted um, higher. Because if your cortisol levels are high later in the day, then that internal coffee pot kicks in again. And yeah, you're not going to um, get good quality sleep. So what actually will cause your cortisol to go up at night. Well, remember that that we've said um, before where people say, oh, you shouldn't eat after a certain time of night. Well, that is only a factor if you are not currently at a healthy weight. So if weight loss is your goal, and I did mention this, I, I think not long ago, actually, but I just think it's important to keep reminding Obviously, the listeners and people that it's not just eat less, move more. (gasps) And I'll get you to talk about cortisol and like exercise and stress in a minute. Extra fries. Yeah, (laughs) extra fries. Yeah. So if you eat at any time of the day, it will, whatever food you have, it will naturally raise your cortisol levels by about 5%. So that's not significant. But if you are not at a healthy weight. So if you're overweight or obese and just look up online body fat like numbers, because I can't really think off the top of my head unless you know them. Nope. Um, (laughs) So um, what classes is overweight and obese? Oh, for BMI? Um, No, actually body fat, not BMI. Um, BMI is 32. Two is it? No, 30. 30. 30 for, uh, th- sorry, uh, 20, 20, 25, 26 to 30 is overweight. Over 30 is 
uh, obese and over 35 is morbidly obese. Yeah, so obviously... um, But so if you are classed as overweight or obese, then... If you're eating, your cortisol levels can rise by up to 51%. So that's going to kick that internal coffee pot switch on. So that in turn is actually going to disrupt your sleep patterns. So if your sleep patterns are disrupted and you're not sleeping like very well at all, you're getting only two to three hours it actually will create an extra buildup of stress. And then that will downregulate your body's ability to regulate insulin. And so a lot of people's livers are, you know, probably not the healthiest they need to be. And so if you haven't actually got a healthy liver, your body will keep pumping out insulin, even when your blood glucose levels are still high. So Stress caused by lack of sleep is going to dysregulate and da- well downregulate um, your insulin um, levels in the body. So again, like it's, it's that vicious. I say the title of this one was like that vicious cycle because so much impacts like your body's ability to get to sleep, to stay asleep, to actually maintain a healthy weight. And you mentioned about willpower and food cravings, and when it comes to fueling the body and to reduce stress on the body. Obviously, we want to eat quality like um, food so that we fuel the body at a, um, a cellular level. So we're feeding the body with like crappy foods. Then our body thinks that we're starving at a cellular level. So it just like craves us to eat more and more of the stuff that we shouldn't be. And a lack of sleep can actually deplete the available glucose that's readily available to the brain by 6% just over just a 24-hour period. So instead of like feeling that you've got no willpower, it's not that you've got no willpower. It's the fact that those glucose supplies that are the the available glucose to the brain is depleted by 6%. So your body just goes like, well, can you give me more sugar? And But luckily everybody's ditched willpower anyway they've gone for discipline 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 yeah that doesn't that doesn't need sugar it's just good in there <laughs> and <laughs> so, discipline like you just like there's got visions of somebody like cracking a whip now and like some wow. drill sergeant wow. <laughs> whatever floats your boat <laughs> and overall good health as well um People really do underestimate the importance of getting the gut healthy. I mean, like something that we like mention time and time again. And and gut health is intestinal health. Intestinal health. Yes, yes it is. Just for the people if they wanted like clarifying. But lack of sleep and sleep deprivation, deprivation can affect the health of your gut. But there's been some studies done saying like, well, can our gut help, um, can our gut health actually affect our sleep? Um, there is some evidence to support this and saying that there's like, um, a relationship between our sleep and the gut microbiome. And what's happening is that connection between our gut microbiome and lack of sleep is actually shifting our circadian rhythm so our circadian rhythm is that 24 hour clock and our body goes through processes through a 24 hour period and that good health is also altering our body's sleep wake cycle and it's affecting the hormones that are regulating our sleep and wakefulness so when it comes to good health we need to be fueling the body to cellular level but good health is way more important when it comes to actually getting good quality sleep and there's a study and i'll just read out where it was from the university of north carolina school of medicine and oh they're noted they're unreliable (laughs) no and i um i've actually heard matt lalon like um reference like these as well because there's the there's these good microbes called firmicutes and typically overweight and obese people will have a higher level of these gut microbes and so that is as a result of an unhealthy gut 
And what happens is these gut microbes actually increase the absorption of dietary fats and they allow the host organism, aka the overweight person, to extract more calories from the same amount of food. So what happens is obese people and healthy weight people, if they're eating the same amount of foods, these like gut microbiomes are different in the obese people and those gut microbiomes are making the obese people extract more calories from the exact same foods that you eat and that gut health is affecting our sleep habits at the same time it's increasing because of, and i don't know like it's, <laughs> it's it is a minefield isn't it oh it always is yeah <laughs> and i mean we get people come and oh yeah well you know i've got a lot of stress going on i've got this co-worker and blah 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 blah, blah. and i mean We've all got stress. Everybody has. And I mean, stress from the 21st century, for sure, it's piled stress on stress. But you see some people and they just get stressed about everything. And then you see other people maybe working side by side with that person. And they've got maybe more things going on, more balls in the air, but they don't seem as bothered. And to be honest with you, stress more often than not is about how you view it as opposed to what actual stress is what the actual stress is and i watched a tedx um kelly mcgun i can't pronounce her surname McGonigal. yeah <laughs> and she was saying that it's not a case of avoiding stress it's just getting good at it and learning what the triggers are and trusting your body like making a decision but trusting trusting your own body to handle the stress that follows and again just for an example you've got somebody you work with and i mean you're in close proximity with this person maybe and they may just rub you right up the wrong way and i mean that person you've it's it's out of your control pretty much what that person does you can't really make a big difference to their thought process what they're like what they think like their personality and everything else but there's no point uh, in getting stressed about it because it's something you've got no control over i mean the only thing we should really get seriously stressed about is things we have a hundred percent control over and if you actually take a step back in your life and look what you've got a hundred percent control over there aren't many things diet is actually one of them uh you have control over what you put in your mouth but aside from that i mean even driving to work and wherever else and your job and everything you look everything's interacting with other people and what other people are doing so stressing out about what other people are doing really is you're wasting your energy. Put your energy into something that you've got control over. Yes, I understand that people do rub people up the wrong way and situations rub the people up the wrong way. But again, just look at your attitude and look at what you get in from it. And, and maybe just brush it off a little bit more. I mean, don't completely ignore the person and be as bad as them. But again, Stress reduction doesn't necessarily come from having less stress. It's how you react to that stress. And again, your reaction is uh, not only mental, it's physiological. And all these physiological things go against that, again, that successful weight loss. Because as Karen's explained with the cortisol, it, it really, from a cellular level, can just disrupt everything you're trying to do. And again, that kind of ties into the psychosocial part of it, which is, again, Karen does uh, webinars and presentations on and is one of her big things. People are so, oh, I'm kind of depressed. And, and then if they're depressed, more often than not, you end up kind of uh, low activity. You don't go out that much. So you don't go out that much or you're not very active. You end up gaining weight. So you gain weight and then you look in the mirror and you've got poor body image. And then you end up kind of low self-esteem and don't feel very great, which makes you depressed which means you've got low activity, which is wake. And again, that's just another vicious cycle. And it's trying to break that cycle. I'm not saying, you, oh, you're going to wake up tomorrow, tomorrow morning and not be depressed. But I mean, there's spaces in that cycle that you can kind of intervene and make a change. And then the next one will change the next one or change the next one. And again, from a psychosocial point, it's uh, you've just got to kind of break that cycle and look at something you can change and look at something you can work on. And then once the chain's broke, things will start to lock up and move move in the direction you want them to. And I, I did a, a presentation here in Winnipeg a couple of weeks ago on the actual causes of depression and the psychosocial health risks associated 
with it and chronic systemic inflammation is really the primary cause of depression and going back to those gut microbes like gut health and how what we put in our mouth is affecting our gut health and how lack of sleep is also um, factoring into poor gut health and like you just said I mean the depression you you get into a depressed state and it's just that and the, you did things just like snowball and escalating. Like you say, you feel like you get, you're on that vicious cycle of like, well, what can I do? It just keeps going round and round and round. And I, I can't, I can't get off. Yeah. And again, going back to the sleep thing, like we said at the start, we're going to bounce in and out of this because all three are tied in. Mm -hmm. So again, with sleep, and I know we did a podcast on sleep uh, nine, 10 months ago, but just even some simple things with sleep and some things you should kind of be doing every day because People again. What I the time and time again, we, I just get people. Oh, you, I don't sleep very well, or I wake up at four in the morning, or blah blah blah. So having a regular sleep routine and things that you do can really start to help. One thing that's not going to happen is if you start doing a regular sleep routine, it's not going to change overnight. Your body's got into a certain cycle of how it is sleeping, so it's going to take time for it to undo those things. And I mean. It, this this small list may not be all everything you need to do, but it's certainly going to be a good start. So I mean, really, the first first and foremost is try to go to bed and wake up at a very similar time every day. Some people again, just because it's the weekend, don't stay up to two a.m. in the morning and every and then get sleep until um, eleven o'clock and then wonder why Monday morning at seven or six a.m. you can't get up. You're giving your body mixed signals. Same thing with going to bed on Sunday night. If you've been up till or didn't get out of bed till 11, you're not going to want to go to bed at 10. With, as Karen says, with the circadian rhythm, I mean, how our body works, ideally, once you're in that in that cycle, and again, if you've just landed on a plane here from yesterday and from a different time zone, then it's not going to apply to you. But the body will cycle through different things, starting at 10 p.m. and then finishing around 5 or 6 a.m. So if you're awake out inside of those hours then your body's going to that cycle of regeneration that your body wants to do is going to be broken so again ideally you should be trying to get in towards bed around 10 ish and then getting up around 6 a.m when you're in bed if that led clock is glowing next to your head or your cell phone's glowing and you've got light in the room or you've got a street light right outside your window that's not going to help try and have the room as dark as you can and people, and um, this was uh, prevalent last week. Uh, people use their cell phones as their alarm clock. Seriously, go to Walmart. They cost eight, ten bucks. Buy just a regular alarm clock. Don't take your phone to bed because those lights off the phone will emit. Um, obviously, blue lights will keep you awake. But the reason I mention it is we had this amber alert here in Winnipeg last week. A little girl. Um, was in the back of her mum's car. She left it idling. And um, there was an amber alert that was sent out in Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Alberta. And, Alberta. and uh, this this alarm was uh, like went off on everybody's cell phone. The, it was almost like they were declaring World War Three. It was so loud. So like, don't take your cell phones to bed with you because like they can disrupt your sleep in way more ways than uh, a few. And like Karen said the blue light that's emitted not just from your cell phone but from laptops tablets kobos your tv and everything that blue light is telling your brain that it's daytime and if if your brain's getting that signal it's daytime a your cortisol is going to stay up a little bit and b your melatonin isn't going to rise so with most cell phones most tablets and things like that, you can actually most of them come now with actually blue light filters built in if it hasn't got a blue light filter built in it's an old unit there's website f.lux lux.com i think and you can download a simple one and i mean our ours is tied to the to the time zone of the, our laptop so when it knows when the sun's going down so it actually alters the light if you want to again dim the lights in the house you can actually buy blue light filter sunglasses so at seven eight o'clock at night you can put these like darker tinted glasses on that filter blue light out 
And again, you're going to start to train your body to make more melatonin at nighttime. Because again, that sleep hormone melatonin is going to put you out. And also that's what's going to, ha- it's going to reduce that cortisol at the same time. So again, light pollution is just something you've really got to think of. And again, especially nowadays with everything's lit up and all the electronics and everything. So, you know, you're reading your Kobo reader or whatever, or your tablet in bedtime just before you go to sleep. And then you wonder why you can't sleep. You just sent your brain the wrong signal. And I do, um, well, until recently, worked with a um, local college here in Winnipeg doing a nutrition and fitness for shift workers. And one of the things that I used to present to those guys was if you're having to navigate shift work and you need to be working when you should be sleeping and sleeping when you should be working, when you get up, put... Not obviously not in the bedroom if your wife's trying to sleep or husband's trying to sleep, but uh, put all the lights on like as bright as possible because then it takes your body into thinking that it's daylight. So hormonally and the circadian rhythm, like you, you'll be trying to trick your body, but also on your way home, um, use amber glasses because it filters out that I'm blue say light. To drive with your eyes shut. <laughs> No, you could do. Well, there's those driverless cars now, I guess, but they've not been proven to be very successful. But yeah, so if you're listening and you have to navigate shifts, using these amber tinted glasses actually helps to filter out the the blue lights of the daylight and actually starts getting your body ready for sleep. So if you do work at the opposite ends of like the day, then tricking the body by putting all the lights on as bright as possible, having daylight lights in your house maybe, and uh, using the amber glasses, like actually when it's light and you need to start tricking your body into going to sleep. And again, same thing, but the opposite way around. So when you get up in the morning, if you're on normal shifts, try and get some sunlight as quick as you can and daylight. Because again, that just sets your brain up saying, oh, okay, and the cortisol is going to rise. And again, that gets that circadian rhythm fired back in. Also, ever lie there and you've got things going on and on and on in your brain and you can't go to sleep? You've got a million things that you have to process, like, oh, I'm falling asleep on the couch, you get to bed and then... <laughs> yeah, take a notepad, write them down. Must... I do, I have one by my bed. Once, you, once you've written them down, then you know you're not going to forget them, so those things then, so now you can go to sleep happy that the notepad is going to be full of all the things that you were thinking about first thing in the morning. Also, as well, make sure that your bed's comfortable. If you're sleeping on a pile of rocks, you're not going to sleep very well. Or a pea, like the princess and the pea. Oh, God. (laughs) Karen spoke about foods and things, and again, we've said ad nauseum that, I mean, everybody's different, and everybody is different. So just because you have this for your supper every night and then you've got poor sleep, try having something different for supper. Try maybe having something of a, a lower carb meal uh, before you go to bed. Uh, maybe reduce portion size as well and see how that works for you. It may not work very well. Try a higher protein supper. See if that works. Maybe a higher fat supper is going to work. And again, experiment with different foods. Yes, it's going to take a little bit of time. But again, take note. You've already got a notepad on the side of your bed. So you may as well write down in the morning what your sleep was like after you had X food. And like I said earlier, that if you're not currently at a healthy weight, then your cortisol levels are going to raise higher than if you were at a healthy rate. So it's not just about whether you eat just before you go to bed, but also, as you were just saying, experiment with the sort of foods. And I get clients to fill out a food mood journal and... I can try and find it and you can put it in the show notes if, uh, um, food mood, a food mood journal. And it just is a really simple one. It's not a food diary. It's just you make a note of what you ate and how you feel, um, one to two hours afterwards. But it could be just like a really simple one that might be useful to fill out so that you can track and measure. So, okay. I had a higher carb meal on this day. So blah, 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 you know, you can you can kind of track. So if you notice that your sleep's um, disrupted, but also I know that we've mentioned before and we did say on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, that we were going to revisit the keto diet. But um, remember I just mentioned not long ago about like our gut microbiome, microbiome being different in 
obese and healthy um, weight people. But my reference to the keto diet is uh, simply the fact that um, our body actually, based on those gut micro microbiomes, our gut microbiome you know, has its own circadian. You're really struggling um, with gut microbiome today, aren't you? I know. I can't get I can't get that word out. No, I should just sort of like like just call it Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I just call it Mike. Our gut Mike. Okay. So it's um our gut microbiome has its own circadian. You don't give up, do you? No, circadian rhythm. I'm determined to get it right. Okay. And so our body actually can handle a higher fat meal better earlier in the day than later in the day based on um, those microbes in the gut. So if you are on a keto diet, the higher fat meal will go down better if you have it earlier in the day than eating a higher fat meal at night. And as I said, that, that, uh, what was it? The North Carolina School of Medicine. Well, those again. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so they would say, I had to like read it again because I've like, it's, it's a long, it's a long title. <laughs> um, you say certain gut microbes will extract different calories from your food. So, and, the gut microbiome disrupts your circadian rhythm. It's got its own circadian rhythm. And so it affects sleep and and the, the list goes on. Oh, well, to, just to finish the list with the sleep is don't sleep in a sauna. We always sleep better in a cool room under a warm blanket. So, uh, yeah, if your room's uh, 24 degrees Celsius or something and you're trying to sleep in there under sheets and everything you're probably going to have a disrupted night. So again, try and have a cooler bedroom. And again, one thing we have did or have here is like we have a like a log burner in the family room. So you can have the family room nice and toasty and the rest of the house cooler. And then when you go to the bed, you're not kind of stuck in that thing of, oh, the whole house is toasty now. So, and that'll often put you to sleep too. But also like just quickly, I know that sometimes we overrun with um, the podcast, but all Ex- interesting stuff though it is exercise can be a stress if i exercise too late in the evening this is me personally it gets me wired and i can't sleep some people find that it's a de-stressor and it helps them to sleep but also some people their way to resolve their stressful lives is to exercise the crap out of themselves but pick Pick your poison when you're doing your exercise. It, exercise is a stress, but it doesn't have to be super stressful. Pick, try and pick something that is not going to fire that cortisol through the roof like excessively. And again, you'd find some strength training, things like that are not really going to overfire that cortisol. Things that fire the cortisol up is like if you're doing uh, high intensity workouts when you're kind of out of breath and that's really just going to get everything fired up and that's going to get the endorphins really fired up and that's basically what will keep you awake. So I mean a strength training workout may make you sweat a little bit and again a cool shower or cycle the shower hot cold afterwards just to kind of cool you down a little bit. But even saying that we've come out of our hot tub and then gone straight to bed on a cool night and uh, been absolutely toasty when we got out of the hot tub and slept like a log whether it was because it was like the super heat of the hot tub and then into the cooler room of the house I don't know but it's uh, it kind of works for us so and again that's back to that individual thing find what works for you but if you keep doing the same old same old you're not going to make any changes and again, trying to step out of that vicious cycle, whether it you it is poor diet, poor sleep, or how you react to your stress, or you've got high stress levels. And, and again, it's trying to break that cycle and make some changes, and trying to think what work get what get something to work for you. And at the end of the day, cortisol is really the driving factor in this whole podcast because it it really does impact our sleep and stress will impact our sleep negatively like and then stress lack of sleep will increase cortisol <laughs> that's why we said it's a it's a totally vicious cycle and even that exercise thing you might love a particular workout but it could be one of the primary things that's keeping your stress levels high and stopping you from sleeping and stopping you from losing weight. So wrapping this one up again if you've got questions you know where to send them I'm not going to repeat it again. Oh. Okay, questions at healthy half hour podcast. <laughs>
dot com. <laughs> so just before the start of the podcast, I said to Karen, oh, what are we going to do next time? She says, oh, I don't know. We'll tell them it's a surprise. Well, I think nobody's going to be more surprised than us. <laughs> so we'll sign off and see you then. That's all we have time for right now, but we do hope that you join us for our next show. And if you want to contribute to an upcoming show by suggesting a topic that you would like us to discuss in more detail, then hop over to our website, healthyhalfhourpodcast.com, subscribe to our podcast and submit your suggestions. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast was brought to you by The Seven Day Shred, and don't forget to share our details with your friends and review our show. Until next time, thanks for listening.